What a glorious day the Lord has given us to worship and grow and connect and serve on this Sunday. Can you believe it? Fall is almost here. We're 11 days away from the National Football League. It's an exciting time, but I'm going to die right in because I believe that God brought you here today for a much greater and grander purpose than coming one hour on Sunday. I believe God has something to say to any and all of us who will lean in and listen, because today we're wrapping up this three-part series. It's been really challenging for a lot of us called Sifted. There's a fascinating conversation that Jesus had with one of his disciples, Simon, while the other disciples listened in. And Jesus, in effect, says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. That just as wheat is sifted, that there's a separation of edible grain from unused chaff, just as good from bad is separated, that Satan is being allowed to sift one of the disciples and the other disciples and ultimately every believer then and around the world so that their faith wouldn't fail, that they would grow deeper and, and grow stronger than ever before. The result would be something so magnificent that when we're going through tough times, we rarely, if ever, think about. But it's very, very important to understand in a season of sifting, because if you don't hold on to what I'm going to talk about today, you will cave in, you will give up, you will live in anxiety and fear, and other people will notice it as well. So far in this series... We've talked about the principle of sifting, and then last time, the process of sifting. We went to the story of Job and the scriptures. Today, I want to talk to you, I promise to talk to you about the promise of sifting. The promise, Stan? You mean like the promise of a presidential campaign? I will do this, I won't do that, uh, read my lips, and whatever it might. No, not that kind of promise at all, because seldom do politicians ever fall through on their promises. I'm talking about a promise that can't be broken. So as we close out this series, I want to teach a powerful promise principle to you with the hopes that wherever you find yourself in your journey, whatever circumstances in your life are eclipsing the glory of God. Did you see how I snuck that in there? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Well, that worked. Here's Here's the principle today, if you're taking notes. We can endure almost anything when there's a promise involved. We can endure almost anything when there's a promise involved. I have the privilege uh, this weekend of how we have all three of our daughters in town and all four of our grandchildren. In fact, are my daughters all in this service today? Could we, Teresa, could you and the girls stand and my son-in-law, Chris, could you all stand? Give it a hug. How about this? There they are. Thank God they look like their mom. Thank God. And, um, Karis and Chris are married in, in North Texas, not where Harvey is right now. Um, Bailey and Jono are in East Texas, and uh, Hannah is back in South Florida. And I say that because a number of years ago now, I took our daughter Bailey out on a date night. And I gave her what's called a promise ring. Anybody ever heard of a promise ring? Lift your hands. 
I promise you, there is such a thing as a promise ring. And I told her that if she would hold off, if she would honor God, and if she would stay sexually pure before the Lord and others, even in the culture called South Florida, that one day her charming prince would come. In a culture that doesn't understand that true love waits, she said, Dad, I believe you and I, I believe God. I'm going to wait for my man. And with that promise, she held out four years of high school and four years at the University of Central Florida because there was a promise that one day her handsome prince would arrive. And arrive he did. His name is John O. They connected. They got married. They had Ezri and Levi. And here's a picture of them. And God is blessed. Because you and I can endure almost anything if there's a promise involved. People would often ask me over the years, pastors go through a lot of ups and downs, churches navigate a lot of highs and lows, ministry is just messy, mostly because it involves people, shake your head like no perfect people allowed, you know? And so they would say, what's the secret to your perseverance, pastor, through all the ups and downs? The secret to my perseverance isn't me, Lord help us. It's not my gifts, my skills, my aptitudes, my abilities. The secret is I hold on to a promise from God that God gave me years ago. And in that promise, God's been holding on to me. It's his church. It's his bride. It's a beautiful mess. But Jesus promised that the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, literally will not prevail against my church. He has more of a vested interest in your church than you do, in my church than I do. Now, if you're just joining us for this series, uh, it's called Sifted. And the idea is that a lot of us have trials and troubles and tension. We have disappointments and discouragement and depression. We have all these suffering and betrayal and hurt and pain, and I could go on and on. But the series really hasn't been about that. The series, listen, is about how God is in the business of helping you grow through what you go through. How God is at work right now, and his business is helping you grow through what you go through. Now today, we're talking about this particular promise applied only to the disciples. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this particular promise doesn't yet apply to you. Not yet. It may at the end of our conversation if you would surrender your life to Christ as some did who were baptized. Other promises in the scriptures do apply, but this one doesn't. And the unique thing about this promise, it comes straight to us from the lips of the most interesting men in the world. The coolest rabbi who ever walked in sandals, Jesus of Nazareth, makes this promise. It it comes to us. Luke is a medical doctor. He's been transformed by God's grace, and now he writes the Gospel of Luke. He's listening to this conversation, and he gives us a promise. Pastor, you've been talking around the promise for 10 minutes. Could you just give us the promise? I promise I will. But before I do, I need to to remind you something. This promise only applies currently if you've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. It only applies to those who are true believers. It only applies to you if you've surrendered your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're still trusting you, if you're still trusting religious efforts, if you haven't fully trusted in the work of Christ on your behalf, on a cross, his resurrection from the dead, the gospel of grace, then it doesn't yet apply to you. So even when things don't make sense, even when it hurts like Hello Kitty, Jesus reveals a promise, and a reminder, we can endure just about anything when we know there's a promise involved. So let's look at the promise found in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and following. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as we, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. This is staggering to think about, and we so often go right past this. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the Lord Jesus says, I have prayed for you and you and you and you and you listening online. This is incredible. He prays for his disciples then, and he prays for his disciples now, and God answers Jesus' prayer. And although he still allows the sifting, He still allows the struggle. Please hear me. In a time of sorrow, in a time of sifting, those of us who are truly his, we will never abandon our faith. We may fail. We may have a weak moment. We may go sideways and slip and slide a little. But ultimately, 
God will produce in us greatness and glory and goodness if we will hold out, if what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. I clearly remember a a lady in church. She'd gone through a bitter, ugly divorce. And she said during that time of her life, the the song that ministered to her the most, and I was thinking this is going to be a great Christian song. She said, no, it was a country song. It it basically said, and I'm going to just hear the words, if you're going through hell, keep on going. That's the country version. If you're going through hell, daddy, he said that word in church. I know, I did, I did. But a lot of times it hurts that much and it hurt that much. People who experience so much pain, so much loss, so much betrayal, it hurts that way. But she held on to the fact, even if I'm going through hell and it feels like it, if I keep on going, I'll eventually make it. Uh, Mark Lowry, the Christian comedian, would often say his favorite scripture was, and it came to pass, <laughs> because eventually it will come to pass. And I don't know about you, but this is a great reassurance to me that when I have a problem, that God is greater than my problem, that God is infinitely stronger than the threshing, the winnowing that Satan, uh, allow, uh, that God allows Satan to have in our lives, because why? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if we will trust God to the end, in the end, that faith that saves us is the faith that will sustain us. Now, I want us to look at the second part of this promise. Jesus says, I prayed for you, why? That your faith may not fail. Remember, Satan's whole goal is to shake, rattle, and roll you so that you fall through the cracks, so that you walk away from God, so that you diss God, you disconnect from God, you disconnect from the church, and we've known lots and lots of people who do that. He aims to have you become hopeless and so desperate that you fall into his wicked hands, and you can almost see him smirking. And yet true faith, tested faith, the Bible teaches, cannot fall through the mesh. It's the wrong shape. And so as long as the disciples are trusting in Jesus, as long as we are trusting in the grace and goodness of God, not ourselves, we cannot fall into Satan's hands. You know, the only person that can ultimately fall into Satan's wicked hands is an unbeliever. If you've been regenerated by the power of grace, if you've been born again into a living hope by the power of Jesus Christ, you cannot ultimately fall through Satan's sieve. And that's why last time we talked about how you and I have to faith our future. Some of you don't know what the future holds. You don't even know what next week looks like. You need to faith your future. And faith is not denying you've got problems. It's not denying you've got difficulties. It's not putting your head in the sand. Denial is not a river in Egypt. You literally, faith is facing the difficulties without being totally discouraged by them and walking away. Now, we don't, do know in our story, don't we, that Simon Peter, Simon Peter, within a span of a few hours, denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And in Luke twenty two thirty four, we read about that. But I want you to hear today that Jesus' response that I'm going to give you in just a moment, Jesus' response to the failure of Peter, I don't believe he considers the brief denial to be an utter and total failure. I need you to hear that. A brief denial doesn't pretend utter failure. A faltering moment, a certain weakness, uh, an unwise choice doesn't mean God isn't with you. Actually, it's pretty normal for a believer in Jesus to actually make a mistake. No perfect people allowed. And there's room for that and there's grace for that. So here's God the Father and He's granting Satan the right to sift Simon. And in response, here's Jesus the son praying, and God doesn't let Peter fall through the sieve, nor will God let any of his own children fall through the cracks by the power of the gospel. Fast forward to this idea. Uh, Some of you know this, others may not. But Peter not only came back to God, but he was used by God in extraordinary ways to turn the world upside down. 30 years later, after this this conversation, he is now the Apostle Peter, and he's writing under the illumination of the Holy Spirit, words that we read some 2,000 years later from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. We, Peter writes, have been born anew unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed 
in the last time. Peter's words, you are guarded through faith. Christ followers, God guards you for eternal security by working within us the perseverance of faith in answer to the prayer and promise of Jesus, regardless of your situation, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how you feel. It just doesn't mean you won't wobble. It doesn't mean you won't slip and slide every once in a while along the way. It doesn't mean you won't ever stumble or make a mistake. You need to hear that today. When you are being sifted, when you are going sideways, your faith will take a beating. You will experience feelings you've never felt. You will have emotions you haven't felt in a long, long time, if ever. You may even fear or walk in anxiety, and you normally aren't an anxious person. But you will never stay that way, ultimately, because God will make sure to bring you out of it. He has a purpose. He has a plan. Because Jesus has been praying for you. And this is why the thing that I've often left you with is sifting is for a reason, but it's also for a season. The sifting will change you from the inside out. It will convert you. It will transform you if you will let it. So be encouraged today that we, you and I as followers of this man Jesus, can endure just about anything if we hold on to a promise. I don't know what God's promise is for you, but I can tell you that God has never made a promise that he hasn't kept. Never, ever. He's the ultimate promise keeper. So we're going to look in our time that remains one last time before we go out of this series at verse 32. There's an A part and a B part. The A part says, I prayed for you and you and you that your faith may not fail. That's the A part. Look at the B part. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your brothers. Peter denies Jesus and Satan is smirking and smiling along the way. I'm sure Peter is devastated, he is broken, he is a hot mess. But the good news is Peter doesn't stay that way. I'll say that again. He doesn't say stay stuck. He doesn't stay in his brokenness, in his disappointment, in his season of sifting forever. Evidently, and this is good news, when we fail, not if we fail, when we fail, Jesus doesn't consider his denial to be utter failure. There's a godly sorrow. The Bible uses the word repent. It's actually a Latin word, which means to change, that you're going one way and you turn and go the other way. It's a change of mind. It's a change of will. And it's also a change of behavior. You're going one way and you go the opposite way. And so Jesus would say, you need to do this over and over. You need to repent and believe and repent and believe and repent and believe. And in this case, Jesus not only knew that Peter would deny him, but Jesus knew that Peter would come back to the Lord. He would repent and come back to the Lord. And listen, again, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what this season has been like. I know last week I heard about a company that laid off at least 100 people in one single day. I know that some of you didn't get the promotion you expected. I know someone who lost a loved one this past week via Facebook, and we reached out to one another in her moment of grief. And I don't know what's happened to you to sift you, to sort you out, to shake, rattle, and roll you, but, it, but, but it's very important in these seasons to hang on because what we learn in the story of Peter is that the one who got strength from God in that moment ultimately becomes the strengthener. The one who was a mess now has a message. The one who went through a temporary test now has an incredible testimony. And if you go back to Peter, to what happened to Peter, if you fast forward uh, a few uh, days, hence, there were two interesting conversations, I think, that Jesus had with Peter that I want to land on. And I think they can offer a little hope to us when we're kind of in the midst of sifting and we wonder if we're ever going to get out of it. These are conversations that I think that we can, we can lean into. So Jesus has just died on the cross for the forgiveness of mankind's sins. He's been entombed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea for three days. And then the Spirit of God has breathed life back into the Lord Jesus and he's raised gloriously from the dead. The stone is rolled away. The soldiers are slain. And in effect, what happens is an angel says to the women, by the way, they're there first. I'm going to have to bring that up to God later. Why were the women there first? They were ready. They were willing. They were able. They're at the empty tomb. And look in Mark 16, 7. The angel, the angel says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and who? Say it with me on the count of three. Tell the disciples, and one, two, three. Peter. Say it again. Peter. 
Isn't this interesting? It's very telling. Don't tell the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, who wrote the Gospel of John and the book of the Revelation, but you go and tell the one who denied me three times, you tell Peter. And the word and there is the Greek word chi, which is the most, in fact, and be sure, don't leave out Peter. Some of you need to know this. Your failure need not be final. What a line here. It's as if all of heaven had watched Peter fail and all of heaven wants to help him get back on his feet. What a God. No wonder he's called the God of the second chance. No wonder he's the God of the do-over. Men and women, the God of the mulligan if you play golf, whatever it might be. He forgives your failures. Maybe you're here today and you wonder, what is God like? That's what God is like. You deny God, you reject God, and God loves you all the more. His grace is reaching out a hand to you and you and you and me. Even when we stiff arm God, even when we run from God, he's chasing us down. He's reaching out to us. He's the God who singles out Peter because he knew that Peter would need reassurance. And if you're here today, God knows that you need reassurance. You've had some struggles and you've had some loss and you've had some pain. And you're wondering, God, where are you? God longs to reassure you. The last story we ever really read about Jesus and Peter. We fast forward to almost 40 days hence. And Peter has done something that is a human tendency for all of us if we were honest. When we go through a season of suffering, of hurt, of betrayal, we tend to want to go back to the old habits, the old lifestyle. To forget all the craziness and the zaniness, say, well, if they're going to treat me that way, and if it's going to be that way, I'm just going to go back to my old fleshly habits, and I'm no longer going to trust God anymore. And apparently, here's what Peter actually says in John 21, 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. That was his old lifestyle. They said to him, hey, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they got skunked. They caught zero, zilch, nothing. The disciples who were once fishermen, their old ways no longer worked. Peter says, that's fine. I'll go back to BC before Christ. I'll do what I've always done. What you always did isn't going to work anymore. You can go back to it, but it's not going to serve you very well. And so that night, it was a fisherman's worst nightmare. They fished all night long and caught zero fish. Well, suddenly, early that morning as the sun's coming up, they noticed a shadow on the shoreline. He's about 100 yards away, and it happens to be Jesus, and they don't know it yet. By the way, that's something else about Jesus. Even when you turn away from him and you go back to your old fleshly habits, your old lifestyle, Jesus meets you right where you are. Some of you need to hear that today. He, he doesn't wait for you to come to him. He comes to you on your turf, in your surrounding, in your environment. He has a GPS knowing right where you are. He's a, just 100 yards away from the boat. And Jesus, in effect, asks a question. Have you caught anything? <laughs> if you were here last week, you heard me say that God never needs to know the answer to a question because he already knows the answers. He's God. So Jesus already knows they didn't catch anything. He just wants them to know they didn't catch anything. He wants them to know their old habits die hard. And he wants you to know that today as well. So look what the Bible says in verse 5. They answered him, no. The question was, did you catch anything? The answer, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. <laughs> who, do, who does he think he is? I mean, here's the thing, though, they thought to themselves, what could it hurt, right? We haven't caught anything. What could it hurt? So right before they row into shore, they said, what the heck? And they throw their net on the right side of the boat, as this character on the shoreline said, and suddenly... The Bible says, the scriptures say, their net was full of fish, 153 fish. It was so heavy they couldn't even haul it in, so they had to row in the net. It's an amazing story. John, 
one of the disciples suddenly puts two and two together. First, we fished all night long. Zero. Secondly, this guy who's not even a fisherman knows right where the fish are, and they respond at his command. And now that I think about it, that voice sounded vaguely familiar. Verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. And there's the story of a great reunion there right along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus cooks breakfast for his disciples. Bring the fish. There's some bread. The resurrected Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. And then he singles one disciple out among all seven disciples there that morning. And you wouldn't believe who it is of all people. It was none other than the one who denied him, the one who had been sifted, the one who had already gone back to his old ways. It was Peter. Now, if it had been me, I'd say, Peter, so I was having a conversation with you about you were going to be sifted. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Remember right after that, you denied me three times, right? Right. You remember when the cock crowed, you were upset about it, and you were sorrowful, and you felt like you betrayed me? Yeah. That's kind of where I begin the conversation. <laughs> Thank God I'm not Jesus. Jesus began the conversation right where Peter was. In effect, Jesus says, Peter, I love you. And I know deep down you love me. We're going to put the past where it belongs in the past. And Jesus focuses on his heart because he loved Peter and he knew that Peter loved him. And so he has this conversation. It's a classic. Some of you know this. I'll read it very quickly. Chapter 21, beginning in verse 15. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Remember how many times Peter denied Jesus. He was a three-time denying fisherman. How many times does Jesus ask Peter if he loves him? Three times, one for each denial. Peter, what do you love? Do you love me more than fishing and getting nothing in return? Do you love me more than your reputation? Do you love me more than being successful in your family business, Peter? If everything were gone except your relationship with me, would I be enough? Would I be enough? And in a season of sifting, you're going to find out if Jesus is enough. And Peter was at a crossroad in a defining moment. He said, Lord Jesus, you know I love you, and I've been missing out on my assignment to be a fisher of men, and I know that you're enough, and now I know, and I'm coming back to you. Listen, some of you think God can't use you after all these bad things have happened in your life. You are wrong, and Jesus is right, and Jesus always has the last word, always. Because you can endure almost anything if you know, and you know, and you know that you know that there's a promise involved. You hold on to the promises of God knowing that God is holding on to you. I don't know why you came to church today. God does. There's a shaking, there's a rattling, there's a rolling all around the world. There's an urgency. There's an eclipse. There's a cultural war. And God is at work and Satan is at work. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's been ultimately defeated, but his time is short. And so he is allowed by God to sift saints. And every one of us that name the name of Jesus, there's going to come a time, a moment in our lives where we will see God for who he is, that God is orchestrating all things for our ultimate good. They don't feel good. And for his glory, for the sake of the gospel. And maybe you're here today and you didn't know that. And maybe you're here today and you didn't know how much that God loved you, that you were... You denied Jesus over and over. You rejected Jesus over and over. And yet Jesus comes right to where you are. God sends his own son to be pounded on a cross 
for your sins and your failures and your denials. He loves you so much that he shed his own blood for you on a cross. And he was dead. The life of God was gone from him for three days. And then God breathed the spirit of God back into the Lord Jesus. And up from the grave he arose. The stone was rolled away. The soldiers were slain. And out comes the angel. The women say, where? He says, he's not here. He's risen. Be sure, go tell the disciples. And don't forget Peter. Don't forget that that mess is going to become a messenger. Don't forget that that test is going to become a testimony. 